Good ask. morning. Uh, I'm Kat Allman with Google's Open Source Programs Office. And we're here today with Keith Packard, Principal Engineer at Intel, and Bart Massey, Associate Professor of Computer Science at Portland State University. They are both, um, safe to say, extremely important to the x.org project, and they're here today to tell us what's up with that. So, Bart and Keith. So the folks, the folks at the remote sites can hear us okay? Excellent, excellent. Um, so, I'm Bart, this is Keith. Um, together we are the, among other things, the officers of the x.org foundation, whose logo is in the screen there. Um, what that means is that we do a lot of administrative work that um, <laughs> no one really cares about. But Keith is also one of the lead developers of X over the last long while. I have kibitzed, I think it's safe to say, over a long period of time in the development of X. And so between the two of us, we probably know something about what's going on. Um, we want to keep this as interactive and informal as possible today. We absolutely have no interest in talking at you, so please don't hesitate to you know, raise your hand, and if I don't notice you, because I tend to be that way sometimes, stand up and yell, do whatever you need to do to get our attention, because you know, it'd be great to actually have us, help us know what would be most interesting to you. We took a stab at it, we'll see how it goes. Keith, do you have anything to add to all that? Excellent. So, um, you know, what we want to talk to you today is about the state of the X window system. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting time to be talking about that because the world has sort of changed um, over the last few years in X. And so, you know, what the message we have for you today, um, I was taught by a, my advisor a long time ago that you get to have one message. And this is our message for you today, which is that, you know, we are back. We are back to being the place which, where the state of the art desktop development is being done and where you can see what the future of desktops is going to be like in a lot of different areas. And that's a position that we held in the early days and it's a position that we didn't hold for a long time but now we're back to sort of being in that spot again. And what we want to do today is talk to you a little bit about the specifics of that, talk to you about the specific technologies we have developed and are developing and what those technologies mean for everybody and specifically what they might mean for those of you who have Google related interests. So that is one of our plans, I think, for what we're trying to do. Um, excuse me for wor using words like harbinger on slides, I know that's not good, but you do what you can. <laughs> So this is the X window system. I'm assuming that not all of you know its insides all so well. And I describe them because they're somewhat different insides than you would find in a Macintosh window system or a Windows window system. Um, the, uh, the important things to see here, um, there's this funny upside down server client architecture where the server, it's a server because it provides a network service, right, is actually attached to your display and keyboard and actually is the thing with which the user interacts. The client programs are notionally separated by, from the server by a network. Of course, in practice, the network may be a Unix domain socket, which is plenty fast, or it may be shared memory, which is even faster. So there isn't really any performance impact here when everything's running locally, but it does allow you to do something that the other Windows systems don't, which is to actually run your application on a different machine than the display and keyboard are on. It's a nice thing. And it also provides a layer of separation in terms of providing this nice, well-defined interface, the X protocol interface, between these things. And so one of the themes that you're gonna see over and over in the X stuff is that everything is very, very modular and it really does have small, narrow, strictly enforced um, interfaces between the pieces. Um, I'm a client side guy and I drew the diagram. And so this diagram tends to be a little heavier on the client side than the server side. Trust me that there's a nice complex picture to be told there too. The most interesting piece of the server side picture is probably the uh, device drivers, which is where the bulk of new work is being done. And the support for extensions, which goes across client and server. One of the smart decisions that the X protocol developers made 
25 years ago was to make the protocol extensible. And we use that facility constantly such that we don't ever have to bump the version number and old programs continue to work, but we provide major new chunks of functionality that way all the time. And we need those major new chunks of functionality because of what we're doing with the hardware. On the client side, there's this whole stack. Um, this is XCB, which is the new version of um, Xlib. We also let you use Xlib if you want. That sort of provides a, a language, a programmatic language interface to the protocol and a little bit of utility functionality. Um, glued on top of that is typically a toolkit. That's your GNOME GTK or your uh, you know, KDE QT toolkit or XFCE, whatever. There's a plethora of toolkits. And the toolkits, uh, the toolkits are um, sort of where Keith and I mostly stop. We do some work in there, but there's whole groups of people that do that kind of development and, inter and interface with, with the sort of core x.org community. That's the freedesktop.org project is sort of the coordinating thing for that. And freedesktop.org and, and uh, x.org are tied together in some interesting ways. So there's that stuff. And then the, another big distinction here is that the window manager, the thing that provides your title bars and that sort of thing, is itself a client and not a particularly privileged client. Um, of the window system. And so there again, we have this very modular separation with real pluggable stuff between, not just between applications and services, but between, you know, but between the management application and the normal applications. So it's, many of you may know this architecture, I may be preaching to the choir, but I think it's a nice architecture and the architecture itself has stood the test of time pretty well. And so what we wanna do is talk about some of the pieces today. Um, and like I say, please don't hesitate to interrupt with questions, comments, whatever you got. So I'm gonna let Keith talk a little bit about the history because he's better at this kind of thing than I am and was there for more of it. So. Okay, so um, X as we know it, X11 started in 1987 when a bunch of companies came together to standardize on a window system that had started in the Unix space called X. Uh, X went through 10, actually nine versions, uh, X1 through X10. Um, in about two years. And people said it would be cool to have a common Unix window system uh, for all the various Unix workstations. Obviously SGI, Apollo, and Sun at that time had their own proprietary window systems. Uh, Digital came along and said, hey, we can, we can fix all of this and come up with a standard window system and get rid of their competitive advantage. Um, so kind of a lot like the web has done in the last five years or so, digital came along and said, well, we'll make all of your proprietary window systems or all of your proprietary networks like we've done today, we'll make all of those irrelevant by coming up with a standard. So in 1987, we came up with a standard X11, um, and for the next 20 years or so, that standard basically remained unchanged. Uh, the functionality from 1987 till about the year 2000 uh, was the same for 13 years, exactly the same. There were no, new f no major new functionality, um, so when you came to a uh, Unix desktop in the year 2000 or even 2004, you saw something very much like we used in 1987. How many people remember the... There were some major new bad ideas. Yeah, <laughs> there were bad ideas, <laughs> plenty of bad ideas, yeah. yeah. So it really took until about the year uh, 2001 and 2002 before we started saying, well, wait a minute, all this stuff really sucks. Um, we need to throw all this stuff away and, and uh, layer some new stuff in. And and and. Politically, there were two options, obviously. We could either um, start a new window system, and if you've seen uh, projects like the Y window system or the Fresco project, uh, those were really ideas to say, well, that the X window system is, is dysfunctional. It's not doing what we need it to do. It doesn't provide the, uh, the user. We, we can't build decent user interfaces with this window system anymore. What do we do? Um, and so one idea, of course, was to throw it all away and build a new window system. The problem with that is that we had the legacy application called Netscape in that time, which didn't run on these window systems. And even in the year 2003, it was very obvious that the fundamental way you were gonna use a computer was radically changed uh, in the, uh, over the uh, previous five years. We were no longer fundamentally accessing local applications. And so this, the web browser literally drove uh, the adoption of X as the continuing standard through this process. It would have been very easy to abandon X and go to another system, except the only web browser that we had was the closed source Netscape. So uh, to some extent, we can thank closed source software for the success, modern success of the X window system. <laughs> 
Um, and then so for the last uh, five or six years, we've started taking the X-Window system and saying, well, it is broken, how can we fix it? Let's add a bunch of new extensions, let's add some new mechanisms and start writing applications in a new way. And that's what we've done. So this is what you used to see. Um, this is actually cool, it's the Wikipedia page for X. So, so, so if you look at if you look at the you know the, the the internet's the internet's archive of information about our fine window system, this is what they think it looks like today. <laughs> that actually, to be fair, there's some new screenshots up there too. Are there? This is the canonical Wikipedia X screenshot, which is hilarious. Um, it looks just as good as it does today, as it did back then. You know, today, <laughs> pretty much. Although the same. it has color, which you know, you should yeah. we should three see colors. colors. Yeah, three colors is a bonus White, extra black, added cost feature here in 1990. Teal. <laughs> yes. That, that, that teal color was the color in 1990. <laughs> you know, like the bright green we have today? In 1990, it was this teal color. Every new high-tech company had to have teal in their logo. It was amazing. That was the only color we supported, pretty much. Uh, but this isn't 1990. Our computers are a lot different now. You know, most of us wear, wear wristwatches that are more powerful than the SGI computers from 1990. <laughs> um, we assume today that you have no resource limit. So, in fact, the two most popular toolkits that we use, QT and, and, uh, and GTK, they have a big abort in the middle of the memory allocation function. If it fails to allocate memory, it, your applications all crash. Um, so, it, that was not true in 1990. Uh, acres and acres of code in the, in the toolkits of the time to manage out-of-memory conditions. Um, most users these days don't have one monitor. How many of you use a machine with just one monitor when you're not on an airplane? <laughs> yeah, one monitor on your desk? 30 yeah, 30 <laughs> inches. <laughs> you need two of those. The, hot, the, cool, the cool kids all have two, right? Um, and more importantly, uh, when we take our laptops around now, we plug them into things, right? How many of you go home with your laptop and, and use just the laptop screen? Yeah, see? You guys are primitive. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, see? It does work now. That's the cool part. Um, the other thing is, is that people expect a lot more from their computer applications in terms of graphics capability. In particular, we used to think that ASCII was pretty cool, right? <laughs> and in 1990, we made it all the way to the point of thinking that, ooh, ISO Latin 1, now that's cool. You can actually have accents on all of your letters. <laughs> Uh, we've moved a little beyond that now, and since that time, um, most, most people now use UTF-8, which covers a few more characters than that. Um, and the other thing is you want to be able to present text in the native person's, you know, in, in typographically correct for the language that you're presenting it in. So when you're presenting Arabic, you don't present, uh, you don't present just single uh, individual letters, right? Use the cursive forms of the letter, the medial, uh, terminal, and, and initial forms of those letters to merge those word to get, words together. So we expect decent typography. We expect decent graphics. Yeah, um, graphics, which is something. And the other thing is, people expect animation now. <laughs> people are used to uh, are used to systems like Google Earth, where you're where you're constantly zooming around. And the screen is no longer static, right? So the the ability to animate the screen, the ability to integrate uh, 2D objects into your animated environment, all of those things have become you know an expectation. Yeah, and this was, this was really animated. Right? I mean, there was a clock, which once a minute the hand would move, and the flag on the mailbox would go up, and oh, this graph would kind of, yeah. you know, Not so much. different world. <laughs> different world. So now everything is supposed to be able to move. Um, and the other thing is we want to be able to take one application, a single application uh, developed anywhere in the world, and take it to the rest of the world. We want to be able to develop uh, OLPC applications and take those out to the third world. We want to be able to take um, Google applications and take those into uh, countries where Google has no presence. I'm sure you don't have much of an office in Zimbabwe. Um, so we want to be able to localize and internationalize our applications in some very sophisticated ways. Um, and I already asked a question. You know, too many of you are clearly stuck in the, in the 1990s with a single monitor. It's so sad. And yes, we will talk to your managers about that. It's okay. <laughs> It's a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, X used to have this wacky notion that you wanted to have multiple different kinds of screens. So you wanted to have your black and white screen and your color screen. When was the last time you used a black and white monitor? Or an 8-bit 
pseudo color monitor, pseudo -color monitor. <laughs> or anything other than 24-bit RGB, right? <laughs> and the whole notion that you would even want to support that anymore, this notion that you want to be able to have windows in 1-bit and windows in 8-bits and windows in 16-bits simultaneously on your screen, that's so 1980s. The, the notion that you want to have multiple simultaneous users connected to the same keyboard, you know, with displ separate displays and keyboards connected to the same piece Computer, of hardware, yeah. you know? We still do that in really Martian applications, but when was the last time you did that? <laughs> yeah. So what we did in the late 1990s was we actually said, okay, we'll unify all the screens into a single virtual desktop. So you can actually move windows between your screens. Wow, this is like a Macintosh. Welcome to 1984. It only took X about 15 years after that. So we fixed that. Um, now all your screens live in one giant virtual desktop so you can move stuff around. Everything is 24-bit color. Um, let's see. Yeah. Here's a, here's a nice Quake instance, for instance. Uh, this is an X environment running uh, Quake on 24 simultaneous monitors. Uh, fully 3D accelerated. Um, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, this is nothing special. I mean, you, you, the X you get out of the box will do this just fine if you figure out how to hook up the hardware. That's yeah, the hardest. you get to find yeah. enough computers and enough monitor cameras. <laughs> yeah, we've actually taken to trade shows uh, as many as like 16 monitors, and it's just crazy. You know, trying to find cables and power adapters <laughs> and more actual physical monitors back when we had CRTs. What a disaster. Um, okay, so one of, the, one of the things that we have moved to is we've moved away from this notion that color is something that the server provides in terms of asking for resources. Oh, I want to have a red pixel now. And you ask the, the X server, so what, what pixel value should I be using for red on today? Uh, we've moved beyond that. Oh, and, and by the way, we're out of pixel values now. Yeah, you can't you have, can't any have red. <laughs> yeah, pick one of the other ones. Um, so we're, we're to the point now when all windows are 32 bits deep and they all have 8 bits of red, 8 bits of green, 8 bits of blue, and 8 bits of alpha. Um, where we have not made it to yet is we, do, we are not using floating point pixel formats. Um, and there's a pretty good reason for that. SGI has a patent on floating point frame buffers. So in terms of doing open source software development, it's very difficult for us to even consider moving into uh, to using floating point pixel values in terms of the values stored in the frame buffer. Um, so I would like to be able to move beyond that. I don't know, you know, how that's going to change. Uh, so we're at this point, we're just in integer pipeline uh, and in terms of the actual stored pixel values. Um, this is an odd story. In 1991, we came up with a color management system, all totally embedded in X. We came up with it. it yeah. Tektronix's. Tektronix and yeah. And so it was all, uh, it was, you know, that was, we hadn't done a lot of color research since the 1930s, but they were starting to bring color research into computers, and they were going back to these uh, French studies from the 1930s uh, and starting to uh, create computer uh, color spaces based upon uh, these, you know, the CIE uh, XYZ uh, reference uh, uh, standard observer that was developed in the 1930s. So we developed a color system based upon those, um, and it was all kind of client side. Which, which means, in kind of this weird way, uh, the APIs couldn't actually convert pixel values. They could only convert color values. So if you had an image in one color space and you wanted to convert it to another color space, um, there wasn't any support for that. You couldn't convert images. What you could do is you could, you, could, you could ask the server, please tell me what pixel value I should be using for a CIE XYZ 222. You know, whatever color value you had, it could do the conversion on a, on a color by color basis. So it was a color space based entirely upon this old notion where you allocated pixel values one at a time. Not very useful for applications. You couldn't take an image and convert it. Uh, so we've pretty much, that never took off, shockingly. One of those many bad ideas uh, that, that kind of died on the vine, fortunately. And now we're trying to get back to the point where we have legitimate color management systems. And this is one place where the Linux desktop lags um, the Macintosh uh, by a long ways. We don't have any credible color management uh, story yet today. It's pretty bad. We've got LCMS, and LCMS does what LCMS does. We don't have an integrated UI desktop yet. So, it, as usual, we don't have any credible stuff. Um, yeah. What else do we have? 
Uh, so what we've built today is we've taken the old Xlib APIs and we've completely replaced them. We have two main rendering APIs now, have Cairo uh, for 2D graphics, and then we have uh, OpenGL for 3D graphics. Um, Cairo comes right out of PostScript. So if you've ever programmed PostScript or PDF, you won't be surprised by it. So we didn't really invent anything when we came up with the new rendering API. We just um, took the uh, kind of the, the existing standards and codified them in a nice, easy to use binding. I, I have. I have to step in here. They, they invented a lot of things, but the things they invented were implementation techniques. We tried to keep the API as familiar as possible while, um, and I say they, I guess I helped a tiny bit, but um, they tried to keep the API as, uh, as postscript as possible while trying to do some really nice things with the actual underlying rendering tricks. And Keith, in particular, dug up this Porterduff compositing model and got it to do some clever things that we'll talk about in a bit. Yeah, so no tricks. And that's one of the keys, right? We're building a standard here. One of the rules about standardization is you don't invent things when you standardize. You codify existing practice. And so that's what Cairo tries to do. It codifies existing drawing practice. So if you've ever programmed in Flash or you've ever programmed in um, uh, PDF to, uh, to write uh, complicated PDF documents, that whole rendering model is very familiar. Uh, Cairo still needs, some, still needs some work for gradient support. It has fairly primitive gradient support right now. But we're trying to figure out how to codify existing practices. You look at the PDF model for gradients and it's like, wow, that's really complicated. I'm not sure we need all of that. And I'm fairly sure I can't accelerate that on too many of my hardware engines. Uh, and then you look at the flash model for gradients. It's like, well, that's a little simplistic. We need a little more than that. So somewhere in between there, we'll try to codify something uh, reasonable. Uh, we're moving through OpenGL 2.1. Um, we were going to be moving to OpenGL 3.0. Um, I'm not sure um, how well OpenGL 3.0 is going to do. Uh, there are some conflicts in the OpenGL community right now about that API. So we're, we're going to stick with our existing OpenGL 2.1 API. It's a fairly sophisticated uh, 3D rendering environment. It's not quite as complicated as DirectX 10 yet. Uh, but they are adding some additional extensions to OpenGL uh, to make it do the things that DirectX 10 does today. Um, we have recently replaced the low-level protocol binding on the wire with something called XCB, and I should let Bart talk about that. Yeah, I can say a few words. It isn't too much to tell because if you haven't seen Xlib, you don't care, and if you have seen Xlib, you understand why it was time to replace this. Um, you know, it's a, it's a classic software engineering story, really. There was this dumping ground in the no man's land between the application space and the server space, where over 20 years, a lot of things got dumped. And uh, at some point, it became time to take this literally megabyte of wacky library full of protocol bindings and a complete color management system that no one ever used to the point where it, it was literally broken for a couple of years and no one noticed. Um, <laughs> and, you know, complete implementations of all these crazy character formats that no one in their right mind would touch in a UTF-8 world. Throw basically all of that away. And so XCB was a fun project because, to architect, because, you know, I got to start with really a clean slate and say, well, what do we want? And the answer was, I want a protocol binding, and I don't want more than that. And I want to automate and ease the job of constructing protocol bindings. And what we ended up with, actually, was something that one of the coolest features of is that what we ended up with is complete XML protocol descriptions of the entire X protocol, including all the extensions. And so now, not only can we generate a nice C binding from that protocol, um, you can and people have picked it up and used that same protocol description to generate bind bindings for other languages, Python, for example, it was probably popular in the room. And so, um, you know, it's it's been one of those things where that's kind of an example of the kind of stuff we've done all over the place, which is to pick up and say, well, you know, the past is behind us now. We have mechanisms to replace things without blowing things up. Let's actually do the piece of engineering that maybe we should have done in the first place, but certainly, in retrospect, would be the right piece of engineering to do. And, you know, one of the themes of some of the stuff we've said so far that you're going to see again and again in the few minutes we have remaining, is um, this theme of moving things off the server side and onto the client side. One of the things that the original sample server did and the original protocol specification did is really wanted everything, to all the computation, all the work, everything to be done at the server. The server is where the user's interacting, so the assumption is that, you know, the hardware there is going to be better, um, you know, the 1990 assumption is that that's where the, you know, the stuff is. And um, 
it's one of those distinctions that doesn't seem like a big deal. You're like, well, who cares where you put it? Most of the time, it's all running on the same machine anyway. Why would I care? Um, it turns out that from an architectural point of view, it's most often the clients that know what they want to do and what kind of computation they want to get to generate it. And the more you can pull stuff out of the server and stuff it in the client, the better the client's control over it. And the more that you have the ability when you do have clients running remotely for them to do the right computation and send the results over the wire, which turns out to be a good idea in the modern world. And um, it tends to clean things up. The server is a big, giant mess. And anything that makes that big, giant mess less big and giant we're very, very happy about. So things get split out into libraries, et cetera. Um, a good example of this would be the translucency stuff, which definitely Keith should talk about because he built most of it. Yeah, so um, we've taken, if you look at the Macintosh window system with its tra transparency support, it provides an, a notion of alpha in Windows, and the window system intrinsically. Um, you should say what an Everybody knows what alpha is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it, it, it takes that notion, and inside the window system itself, it has this notion of how windows are composited together onto the screen. It blends them in Z order from back to front. Fairly simple notion. Um, in the X environment, when I went and implemented that back in 19, yeah, it really was uh, 2000, year, the year 2000, went and tried to implement that, um, it made the window system very, very brittle. Um, it, a, a, a huge number of changes in the window system, and all of a sudden, all this cool, fun cool functionality they wanted to be able to do, like have little little uh, live icons of your applications, or wanted to be able to do some animated animated uh, minimize and, and iconification uh, stuff like that. All of a sudden, that had to all be built into the window system. And so, instead of this notion of pulling stuff out of the window system, I, I was dumping more and more into the window system, and the server was getting uh, larger and larger. It's like I had to put projective transformations in to, when I was presenting the window, so that I could, uh, pr uh, uh, so that I could uh, uh, tilt them to the side. I had to have multiple projective transformations so I could uh, warp them in odd ways. And all of a sudden, this the, this very simple notion of doing alpha compositing in the window system uh, became an enormous extension. So I threw all that away and sat for three years and was able to figure out a mechanism whereby all that I really needed to do was have the applications paint into an off-screen region and then, then tell an external application about all of these uh, off-screen images and let that external application do whatever it wants. And that, no, that fundamental notion of taking the control of the compositing out of the window system and placing it into this external new agent called a compositing manager meant that I could do some um, uh, a very simple extension. It took me like three days to implement. And all of a sudden, it unlocks this tremendous amount of capability. Um, I don't know if any of you have played with um, either the uh, core X compositing manager or applications like Compiz that are able to do this tremendous amount of you know, eye candy uh, that was uh, impossible only a few years ago with a very small change to the X server itself. Um, and that was kind of a neat thing. Oh, similarly, we did all the same stuff with the rendering now. All of the rendering is now done on the client side with the minimal amount of stuff that the hardware can actually accelerate put into the Windows system server itself. So things like uh, spline tessellate, uh, uh, polygon tessellation, spline decomposition, uh, actual rendering of glyphs from outlines, all of that work is on the client side. And the only thing that's in the server is a, ren a simple rendering engine. It looks a lot like OpenGL now. OpenGL is a very, obviously, OpenGL has driven hardware design and vice versa for the, for the last 20 years. So to ignore how um, other high-performance APIs use the hardware would be foolish. So we have a very similar notion of only doing the low-level stuff in the actual graphics library and pulling all the high-level abstractions up into the application. Yeah. One, of, one of the interesting questions is, okay, now we've got you all this capability to do eye candy, and we've got a lot of eye candy now. One of the things that I'm kind of interested in is what kinds of useful things will happen now. The, you know, right now we can make your windows catch on fire and burn down. That, that's cool, but <laughs> you know, our hope is that this will lead to leveraging some really cool HCI things that will actually make a difference in how people use computers. That's hope, where we're hoping to go. Um, yeah, I know. It's hard to believe that you would first go for shiny, but there you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, the, drawing, the drawing model, um, the original drawing model was literally, from my understanding, and Keith will correct me if I'm wrong, a, a hack that was meant to be replaced later. Um, the, nobody knew quite what to do about drawing in the 
late 80s. And so X did something, and it turned out to be horrible in ways that we could spend all the whole talk telling you about war stories about how it went wrong. <laughs> The good news is protocol extensions. So we replace it all. We did this Rendo Cairo thing that Keith just described. And, you know, not only is it pretty, but it has the potential to be hardware accelerated by your 3D hardware engine. And we're working on that and getting, starting to get some results with that. And what that means is that you get pretty and you get, um, at the same time, nice quality. Um, and in particular, um, I think it's important to say, Keith will certainly say this as well, I'm sure, that typography isn't just putting text on the screen. I mean, <laughs> and it isn't just putting it on the screen in a font. Um, it's more than that. It's about, you know, making things work in ways that a professional typographer would understand as pretty. And the, the Mac, and even to some extent Windows, have made a lot of progress over the last 20 years in you know, being able to use font, professional grade fonts that are properly hinted for the screen and being able to control, you know, things like the lighting and inner word spacing and inner character spacing and blah, blah, blah. Being able to render, you know, properly splined, you know, shapes, et cetera. So that it, you, you go from, you know, remember that 1990 slide we showed you with the bit mapped fonts of doom all, you know, equal equal spaced, uh, monospaced characters, it's like, Ugh. so, you know, we needed to fix all that. And Keith really, there again, was the one who did a lot of that work. So probably it makes sense for you to sort of say something. Sure. Um, so in the year about uh, 2000 or so, uh, there was this push to get any alias text into the X-Window system. And there was this, there was this idea that maybe what we should do is take the existing core text primitives and somehow sprinkle pixie dust on them and make them anti-aliased. Um, and in fact, there's a whole implementation of server-side anti-alias fonts from the same era. Um, at the same time, others of us realized that anti-aliasing wasn't all we wanted. You know, that was not sufficient. It wasn't sufficient just to make each individual glyph look good on the screen. We really needed to move beyond that and get to the point where the text on the screen looked good. And we also wanted to be able to provide for applications to render text in new ways and still get at the underlying acceleration primitives of the system. Uh, so a lot of the ways that people are doing a hinting of text and laying out of text right now, they're starting to ch uh, change where glyphs are located on the, in, in a, in a sub-pixel matrix. They're starting to change um, how using colors on LCD screens to uh, improve the appearance of fonts. All these kinds of optimizations that are really nice to be able to experiment with well, doing all that work in the server side made no sense because there was no way we could experiment. There was no way we could explore beyond what the server offered. So instead, and at the same, uh, at the same time, in, when we were redesigning the text in the uh, Windows system, we, we figured out that maybe it would be a good idea for applications to be able to provide their own fonts. If you're writing a PDF viewer, if you're writing a, any kind of document preparation system, that document preparation system is going to want to be able to provide its own fonts. If you need to be able to provide, if the client needs to be able to provide fonts, you have to have an entire mechanism for the client to provide fonts. If you're going to provide a mechanism for the client to provide fonts, why do you also need a mechanism for the server to provide fonts? And that was the big epiphany. It's like, oh, wait a minute, we have to do client-side fonts. We have to provide this. It's an application requirement. Why are we also going to develop a parallel mechanism to do server-provided fonts? And so we just decided to throw all the server-provided fonts away. There are, no, there are no fonts in the Windows system anymore. The Windows system renders glyphs. And you provide the glyphs as little RGB or little alpha-valued images. That's all you get to provide is a mask. And as many as you want. And so now the application is free to render the glyphs however it wants, uh, using subpixel hinting, using subpixel positioning, whatever it wants to do, it can provide as many different glyphs as it wants. And so all of a sudden now the client is in total control of what's presented on the screen. It doesn't have to rely on the server to do anything. Um, Sun actually came up with a new text presentation system uh, that used the, that pumped all of the text for your document all the way into the window system and through to a separate server on the other side. So you take an entire paragraph of text and hand it to the X server. Does this seem like a good plan? And then it would go through to a separate back-end server 
which would do all the layout and font computation and uh, basically cr construct an image of that paragraph to put on the screen. So your application was doing text editing by sending X protocol requests. That, that was really the alternative. You, know, you either did everything on the client side or you did everything on the server side. And we decided that maybe standardizing on a text editing protocol over the network wasn't the best plan. So we pulled everything client side. And the nice thing about the Cairo integration, and then we need to move on, is that it means that the, the Cairo integration means that text isn't magic anymore. I mean, really, at the end of this process, use the same APIs to render simple text um, that you do to render simple graphics. And it means that things like printing now automatically work. One of the big problems in Mac and Windows world is if you have magic APIs for um, doing, putting stuff on the screen and they're different from the APIs that you use to provide printable stuff, then what the heck do you do? We don't have that problem because Cairo was designed from the beginning to render to multiple surfaces and just do the right thing. And uh, you know, if you look at what Silverlight's doing on the Microsoft side now, they're basically in the same space, um, but you know, by a much different, more elaborate approach than you know, sort of what we ended up with, where we can generate the right things magically. Here's some dumb little examples of uh, Cairo rendering output. You can hit CairoGraphics.org and see this. And you know, the, the reason I wanted to put this slide up is just to show that you know, the end result of all this engineering is that you know, that is pretty. I'm sorry. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that we were we've really lacked um, on all these systems for a long time is that the details need to be right, and the the the, the user experience with a presentation of graphics is going to be really flawed if the graphics aren't anti-alias perfectly, if the if the curves aren't real curves, if um, Compos alpha compositing isn't done the right way. Those little things that you think, ah, oh, who cares? Only graphics geeks care about this stuff. It turns out, no, not so much. Um, if you just look at the output experience that we get as the result of all this work, it's a nice output experience. Um, we need to speed up or we're gonna run out of time. So now we'll fly through some stuff and then do some demos and take some questions. But uh, the, the 3D rendering um, situation, I think we've talked about a little bit. Um, one of the important things here is that really we're trying to blur this distinction between 2D rendering and 3D rendering. If you go to SIGGRAPH these days and look at the papers, you know, 2D rendering is considered uninteresting and uh, except for some specialized you know, stuff, it's considered an uninteresting field and there's this sharp distinction between the two things. We think that isn't right. We really desperately want to be able to use the 3D hardware to do good accelerated 2D rendering, and we really desperately want to be able to, um, you know, sort of use the 2D window system model with 3D stuff. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tricky thing to do. And one of the things that's an inhibitor, of course, and everybody knows about this, I know we get questions about it, so we have to say is, look, you know, we've had this problem, which is that Apple has had very tight control over its hardware. Microsoft has had very tight control over the driver manufacturer, I'm sorry, the hardware manufacturers. And between the two things, we're left in a situation where we've been trying to play catch up and actually getting this stuff to run on real hardware. The good news is that today, for the first time really in a long time, we're starting to win that game of catch up again and really be able to go back to have open source drivers for everything. Um, right now, ATI has some, given us some docs and promised us some more. Um, Intel has just released full documentation for their latest chipset and has provided open source drivers for all their chipsets. Um, NVIDIA is still in binary land, but there's a good reverse engineering project underway and some other things that are happening to try and deal with that problem. And so, you know, this grand plan, which depends ultimately on us being able to talk to modern hardware, what a surprise, really is underway. Input, um, you know, one of the things that gets neglected in a Windows system sometimes is input. And in recent years, there's been a real re resurgence of interest in the HCI community and not just what do you render on the screen, but how do you talk to the stupid thing. And in that space, I think we've done some pretty cool things. Our, our, our system, we just modernized so that it actually interacts properly with hardware and interacts properly with the... Um, with things like USB devices that have an, an HID specification. Yeah. So 
kind of disagree with that statement okay. because I've uh, I have a 3D or actually a 6D input controller yep. that I've used, and your system only seems to really work well on playing mice, traditional mice, and traditional keyboard. Okay, so the the question was, what about magic devices like Six Degree of Freedom input things? Um, what about that? My understanding is that the very latest bits we have have made a lot of progress with this. I don't know when the last time was you tried it, but Keith would know more about it than I do. Yeah, so the problem is, is that we have two totally separate input mechanisms in the, in the Windows system today. We have the core, the core input mechanisms that only support a 2D pointer and a keyboard. That's all the core supports. We also have a totally separate mechanism called X input, which does support as many axes as your device has. Problem isn't necessarily the support for the devices. Right, it's, it's, it's the application it support. Right. Well, it's the plugging it in and it actually getting configured right. Oh, happens. that part we have solved actually recently. Yeah. Okay. So the yeah. hot plug notions, the hot plug notions, we actually now use a HAL and DBUS mechanism for notification of new devices in the system, and we automatically incorporate those into our X input stuff. Because last time I checked, it just if it's a HAL input mouse, it just automatically sets the first two axes right up well, and down, left and right. That does not. Work and for now it's device. configurable. You can that's actually correct. configure it on the fly, so you can okay. actually uh, change which axes are being used. So that's literally the last couple of months. So okay. yeah, I mean, so that's, <laughs> that, that's yeah. the last <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I was just wondering where the status of that was because that was Absolutely. the only thing. Because we plugged it in, it worked, and then the mouse is just unwieldy because well, yeah, yep. it's using the wrong two axes. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, every time you plug in a multi-access device, it's like, oh, my scroll wheel now is my mouse. Yeah. Not so, <laughs> yeah. so the input is still an area where we're doing some in, in, intense research to try to figure out how to get hot plugging to do the right thing most of the time. Uh, the other area that we're working very actively right now is multi -po multiple pointer support, where you actually have multiple pointers on the screen simultaneously. So if you look at devices like the iPhone, which uh, supports multi-touch, or you have, look at devices um, like the Microsoft Table, where you have multiple users interacting with the device simultaneously. We have support for those devices today. And so you can actually have, we actually have a, the, the multiple uh, X pointer stuff supports this notion of actually doing image capture on every uh, motion, motion of whatever event. You can actually get an image capture. Uh, so if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you have a camera device pulling for hand location on the screen, we can actually get an image back of the hand every frame. So you can actually track the shape and position of the hand on the screen if you want. Uh, so we have devices like that. We have, and you can have as many of those as you want um, identified as different users. And we have cl uh, cool kludgery that actually integrates that with the existing window system. So you can have two people using the, the same window system simultaneously interacting with two different applications. Today? That patch is on a branch, okay. and unfortunately the person doing that work is going off on uh, vacation for two months, otherwise I would have had him integrated last week, vacation, but... Vacation, my, my heck, he's, he's, he's getting his dissertation published and, and defending it here in the next couple of months, is what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, then he goes on vacation, because after all, when you're done with your dissertation, you should go on vacation, trust me on this one. But, uh, um, but... Yeah, absolutely. He's done this incredible piece of work. And the important thing to emphasize about that piece of work is this, this isn't like some particular multi-touch device with some particular display and some particular magic drivers. This is, to the extent that it works, it works across everything that you might want to plug into it all the time. And that's, you know, that's one of the things we've really tried to do is not just, you know, have demo kludges, but have things that really are paths forward. Um, you know, the people who are interested in Android phones, you know, we should say a, a little bit about, you know, sort of small devices and what the deal is there, which is that, you know, on the one hand, small devices, you know, are not so interesting anymore because the small device, smallest devices you can get now tend to have a lot of resources. And we're, we're sort of recapitulating the 80s and 90s at light speed uh, in the small device space. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, and, and, and as a result, there's sort of not there's decreasing reason every month to not just use X on these platforms. And one of the nice things about X is that it really does scale just fine to these platforms. So you, you, know, you can see some of the things that people are doing that already do a lot of that. Yeah, Chris. Matt, if you're about to no, no, please. Disagree with you. Okay, please. Um, I think that X is way too heavy on the open moco. I mean, have you tried this? I mean, it's yeah. really yeah. thick, man. I mean, yeah. the responsiveness is crap. And maybe that's just the way they've implemented it. But Most of that I is actually the toolkit. way too much time in the camera. Yeah, uh, you know, so in, in the, on the, above the, so when I say X, 
sorry, the, so the question was, well, no, the Open Mocos X interface sucks. Oh, <laughs> to, to sort of, in terms of... No, so, so one of the problems that we have all the time with X, and we've had it for 25 years, is that the word X is to some extent you know, one of these horrible, horrible things. At, 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 the, at the toolkit layer and above, you know, is a very different world than the server layer. The thing that's getting in your way, I would claim, and I think Keith would agree with me, is not the X server getting in your way. And it's not even the low-level X stuff getting in your, you know, mechanisms getting in your way. It's that the kinds of toolkits you write for small devices and the kinds of applications you build on those toolkits do need to be different. And X will support all that. And, you know, we encourage people to not just compile GNOME or, you know, KDE and run it on their phone. That, that isn't a good idea. But, what? Yeah. Sorry, go on. So, yes, one of the things that we have noticed is that um, the GTK, to, uh, GTK Windows, the GTK FB port, if you run GTK FB, you measure performance of that system in terms of memory usage and speed and application interacting uh, response, it actually turns out to be better to run GTK on top of X because the GTK FB has re-implemented a Windows system badly. So in terms of, yeah, and the, sa the, same, the same thing is true of other embedded, uh, embedded Windows systems like this. X as a fundamental Windows system is lightweight and, and efficient. X with a, with a giant toolkit on top of it is not any better than the giant toolkit on top of a dumb frame buffer. Um, but it is, it is altogether too easy to say, oh, we have an embedded device, it has enough memory, let's take our desktop toolkit and our desktop window system and put those in our embedded device. And that's not such a good idea. Yeah? Are you not in a for devices or small um, in, in terms of lightweight toolkits, if you look at something like FLTK, those are actually, that's actually a fairly lightweight toolkit now. It even has, even has GL support in it these days. It, and it can provide a much higher performance experience in these smaller devices. It is not as pretty. As, as GTK, and it's missing some fundamental functionality. One of the key things we've been talking about is text presentation. One of the key features of the GNOME environment and the QT environments are real internationalized text layout engines, which are not small. It's a huge, unfortunately, fonts don't provide enough information to do credible internationalized, internationalized layout without the uh, layouts engine knowing about the language that it's presenting, which really sucks. Which means that every time you take, every time you want to do a new, uh, a new um, uh, character system, and present that to the user, you have to write more layout code in your text layout engine, and so these layout engines grow and grow and grow, and so you have the Devanagari uh, 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 text layout system, you have the Farsi text layout engine, you have the, you know, the the uh, Latin One text layout engine. They're all different. Which is crazy, you know. The font designers should have been able to figure out some programmatic way to have the fonts know how to lay themselves out, but they don't. And so, embedded systems have this fundamental conflict. They want to present a desktop level, a desktop type uh, experience to the user, and they want to do it on the cheap. And so, what do you cut out? You know, do you cut out your text layout engine? Do you cut out your double buffering? Do you cut out your 3D engine? Uh, do you cut out your um, uh, floating point numbers because you're using an ARM processor? You know, that's, that's some huge costs that you take in terms of taking desktop software and moving it into a embedded platform. It's a, it's a difficult experience. Um, certainly not using X can save you a bunch of memory, mostly because Xlib is a megabyte of totally useless code. We fixed that. Yes. <laughs> so there are some things we can trim out of X. Um, I have done X on very small environments. Um, if any of you have ever seen the Compact Itsy or other, uh, other small devices that we uh, did it at, uh, at DEC, uh, the Western Research Lab built some very small devices a long time ago. With 32 megabytes of memory, we were able to run a complete X stack. Now, we weren't able to run GNOME. <laughs> we couldn't run QT, but you can run X. So the question is, do you want X in an embedded environment, um, or do you want the toolkits that sit on top of X? And if you don't want the toolkits that sit on top of X, it is a legitimate question, why do we want X at all then? And sometimes the answer is because X is more efficient. And we found that over the years, uh, every time we do a custom window system that is tightly tied to a toolkit, it turns out to be a huge amount of effort to make it go as fast as X does with that same toolkit API, uh, which is kind of surprising. Um, I could go on yeah. long stories, but we, we probably stop. shouldn't. But, um, but hopefully, Chris, that answers at least your basic question. We, we can talk about this more afterwards, definitely. Um, the, 
the you know, we've talked a lot about internationalization. We've talked a lot about internationalization and localization. I don't know how much more we need to say there, except to say that, you know, the thing that's really, one of the things that's really driving this, of course, is that open source is nice here because it means that the local users localize their stuff. And that turns out a way to get more and better localization. What a surprise than you would have gotten by trying to pay a team of people to do it. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, happened really early is Pango, which was our sort of internationalized text layout engine, Unicode text layout engine, plus Keith's font config stuff, which helped do font selection for that, um, plus XFT that did rendering of mystic fonts. Um, so with that combined solution, we were really pretty ahead of the curve in actually getting what both the Mac and Windows environments have right now, which is you know, the ability to do things like this. You know, this is not, this is not just this rotated, right? This is, you know, what if you have mixed languages that all, some of them are left to right, some of them are right to left, what if some of them are top to bottom? And by the way, you know, there's all kinds of rules for combining characters and for, you know, which rotation of characters you wanna have. Um, this is all auto-generated. You basically stuff UTF text, at, UTF-8 text at Pango and it does this. Um, that's pretty cool. And it does it across a wider range of languages and a wider range of constraints, really, even today, than the competing systems do. Um, so it's pretty cool. So we'll wrap up here. You know, everything we've told you today, I mean, from a Google perspective, might be a little bit, well, so what? The desktop is dead. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there have been people predicting the death of the desktop over the last few years. It's gonna be swallowed up by convergence devices. It's gonna be swallowed up by the web. The only, we'll be back to where we were, Keith alluded to originally, where the only application you care about is your browser on the desktop. Um, it's a real legitimate concern. It's one of the reasons why we're pushing so hard on this work, is that, at the end of the day, there's some tremendous advantages of the general purpose desktop as a platform. It's a wonderful thing to, you know, you can get a, an immediacy, you can get some resources, you can get a bunch of things that you just don't have with other platforms. But we've put ourselves in a weird situation over 20 years, and by we I mean the large we of the entire computing community, where it is so hard to develop for the desktop and develop quality applications for the de desktop and to get those applications to run cross-platform and to get those applications to run well, um, you know, and to give the user a good experience at the end of the day that people have been desperate to do anything but develop desktop applications. And the open question, I think, the question that I'm trying to answer in the affirmative is, can we do an order of magnitude better? Can we make it so that you would credibly consider writing a desktop application instead of writing a web app or developing a custom device, a custom piece of hardware for pity's sake, to get your user what they need? And you know, I think the answer probably is yes, but it's a challenging question. Did you have stuff you wanted to say about that, Keith? Yeah. And you know, in conclusion, I just wanted to say that depending on how you count, this is the seventh, eighth, or ninth year of the Linux desktop, um, <laughs> as proclaimed in various technical and trade publications. So, you know, what's going on here, right? How can, how can it keep being the year of the Linux desktop and yet the Linux desktop hasn't apparently taken over the world yet? And I think, you know, there's some really interesting answers to that question. I mean, X is arguably the largest running, the longest running large open source project in history. You know, and over that time, you know, numbers of users, rate of adoption has been a constant upward. We've, you know, the percentages haven't necessarily been a constant upward because the market has grown so much in the meantime. But we always have people picking up and trying stuff. And one of the weird things that happens in this space is that everybody expects these exponential growth curves. And something's considered a failure if within a few years it hasn't sucked up everybody. Um, X isn't like that. X is gonna be slow and steady. And, you know, the thing is that, you know, we're working in a weird part of the space. We really are, to go back to our original message, trying to invent the future. We're trying to not just keep up, which is hard enough, but trying to, trying to go where the desktop is going over the next five, 10 years. Um, we think we think we're finally back on track doing that. We think we're to where 
um, you know, you can look forward to things happening on the month time scales that used to happen on the multi-years or never time scales. And we think we're, with things like MPX or Cairo that we really can be where the major proprietary folks won't get for a while and really give users the experience that they really need to have. Um, and that's, I think, I think that's our message. We'd love to have some questions in what little time remains. Um. So this is um, for the, an Intel chip. I know that you guys released the, uh, the output mock log last time, and I connected it to my HGTV at home through a VGA cable, and it will not detect, and then this is kind of like specifically for the card. I'm just wondering if this kind of thing, is, I mean, I, I think it's just a driver issue, but it would not, you know, do, it would not re-detect like the proper mode lines and everything during a running yeah, session. Yeah, so how do we solve technical problems with things like uh, um, drivers connecting to specific monitors? In this particular case, um, you have a monitor um, that is offering uh, EDID over DDC, uh, which is an I2C protocol over a wire on your VGA cable, and it's not working. Why is that? Well, the, e the DDC specification is rather vague about the clocking that we use for that protocol, and the vendors oftentimes use uh, very tight tolerances in the monitor, and the computer's <coughs> not speaking the right protocol, and so we fail to make a DDC connection. And so we fail to read the EDID data out of the monitor, so we have no idea what modes the monitor wants. It goes a little deeper, though, because you got, the drivers appear to be able to do it. Like, if I start X, it works fine. It detects all the mode lines. It's, okay. only, it's only when hot plugging. So okay, actually, this, this is actually a very simple problem, then. If, if the problem right now is that we cannot resize the frame buffer after we start the X server. And this is a dumb bug. And so if you start with one monitor connected that's small and plug into a larger monitor, I can't resize the frame buffer to cover the new monitor. It's just a stupid bug. Okay. And so what you can do is you can configure the initial frame buffer size bigger. Right. And then it will work. And there's documentation how to do that. Right. But, so. it's, but it's a horrible cool yeah. solution. And the right thing is to make it do the Fix right that. thing. Right. And uh, it'll be fixed in a couple months. Right. <laughs> the, Everything's fixed in a couple months. <laughs> but the larger issue is that there is this giant push, which this brings up, to get rid of configuration. And the, the reason that I, you know, we're so appalled about bugs like this is because our eventual plan is exactly what you say. You plug arbitrary hardware into this thing when it, while it's running, you fire it up when it starts up, and unless you're asking for something very freaky, which what you asked for isn't, it should just work. And we've made more progress in the last two years, I think, on it should just work than we made in the succeeding 10. Right. But there's still a long ways to go. We're not fooling ourselves we're done yet. a lot of really great things. I just think there's some still really oh, yeah. hard. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's some really hard issues, like actually having a database of the settings for devices. Well, no, no, actually, you don't. In this particular case, the, the devices offer the data to the system. Well, I'm, I'm not speaking specifically of yeah. that. I'm talking oh, about, other I'm talking about the input yeah. device from earlier. The point is the, the user should never have to know or care. Right. Yeah. How much do you think the distros are screwing you? So, I mean, I, I have personally seen that you've improved a lot. Uh, the last few years, I've found that you know, people come to me with uh, X problems. And all I need to do is come to meet crap out there. Yeah. <laughs> and we're working with distributions. So distributions, yeah. How much are we working with distributions to make their configuration systems work better for users? And a lot of that really is direct uh, um, developer to distributor communication about what not to configure anymore. It used to be you had to configure everything to make anything work at all. And right now, what we're trying to teach people is, no, we can auto-detect everything. And for settings where the auto-detection is going to work, please don't configure it, because you'll get it wrong. And so uh, Debian, for instance, right now, the default X configuration doesn't have any mode lines. It doesn't have any screen information. It's all auto-detected. And that's because I'm a Debian developer, so I can tell them to go fix things. <laughs> yeah, the synaptic. That doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Question over here? Yeah, could you elaborate a little bit more on your relationship with NVIDIA? You said there was a reverse engineering project going on. Right. NVIDIA, NVIDIA has, uh, provides binary drivers for um, their chipsets under Linux. Um, the trouble with that is if you have a power PC machine like an old Macintosh, or you want to run 64-bit Linux instead of 32-bit Linux, you can't use their drivers. You, or, or you have the wrong kernel version. You want to build your own kernel, you know, shock and horror. Um, 
So there are a lot of users who can't use the binary drivers. The other trouble with binary drivers is that distributions like Red Hat, uh, with their um, rail distribution, they won't support you if you use a binary driver because they have no idea what that does to your kernel. So there's a lot of users that have very credible reasons for wanting to use an open source driver. And so what a bunch of users have done is actually reverse engineered the hardware to the point where they can write a video driver for a chip without any manufacturer support. Now you might imagine this is an, not a very easy job. And it's a horribly complicated job. And effectively what they're doing is they're monitoring reads and writes to registers on the chip as they run the proprietary driver. And they have some amazing kludges, up to and including page faulting every access. So they map the card read only, and they hit a page fault every time you try to write to the card. They'll trap the page fault, di disassemble the instruction that was trying to do the write, figure out what address and data is going to go to the card. Yeah, we're aware of some of the pain, and I was curious if you were applying any pressure on them. Um, I think the best pressure that we've been able to apply is, is the efforts of ATI and Intel to support the community in the way they want to be supported by providing documentation. We don't ask for... Um, open source drivers, uh, in, and I work at Intel, and we are providing open source drivers, but I think far more valuable than those drivers is documentation so that users, developers, uh, distributors can fix bugs in the driver and implement new features that we aren't interested in doing. So I, it would be nice if NVIDIA was able to do that as well, and I'm hoping they're going to. Certainly, the, their two major competitors are. So if they want to play in the, in, in the Linux space in the future, they may be forced to, and I'm hoping they will be. They will feel compelled to. Yeah, question here? Sorry. No, it was me. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> sorry, pointing at you. Um, yeah, on that though, I mean, it seems, the, it seems that the market share is so small. What, what do you think actually makes people... I mean, Intel obviously is sort of open source friendly, but like, I don't see why NVIDIA would want to. Ever. Why would NVIDIA and ATI even bother because the market's so small? Yeah. It is a small market, but it is also a technological adopters market. And so there's, to some extent, there's a... Um, well, for, actually, for NVIDIA and ATI, there's a, there's a, a non-trivial a non market. Uh, NVIDIA and ATI both play heavily in Hollywood, and Hollywood is pure Linux these days. They don't run Windows. So if you want to sell your high-end graphics cards into a, into a Hollywood production studio, which is worth a lot more in marketing than it will ever be worth in actual sales, you need to provide them Linux drivers. So in terms of playing in the Linux space, they don't have any choice but to be in the space because a lot of their customers are demanding it. In terms of providing open source stuff, um, a lot of these same customers are starting to demand um, RHEL support or SUSE support from Novell. They're, they're starting to demand things that the NVIDIA drivers uh, uh, eliminate. I think it's fair to say, too, that while I don't minimize the Linux desktop market is small, it's not as small as you think it is. The, the size, to the extent that we've been able to gauge it, of sort of stealth, large-scale deployments of, in industry of X desktops is actually quite large. And the thing is, companies have no motivation to talk about those deployments. And in fact, they have every motivation not to make a big issue of the fact that they're using Linux inside their companies. But there's a ton of them out there. And you know, the thing is, right now, a lot of those companies are making purchasing decisions about what they're going to do over the next five years with software. Um, you know, and between sort of some uncertainties in the Windows space about what's going to happen and, you know, this and that, I, I think it would be very risky for any kind of manufacturer to sort of write that market off because it seems small today. I think we need to wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, well, do you want to take one more or do you want to call it good? Let's see. Let's take one more. Okay, so what's coming in the next two months? <laughs> <laughs> it's an excellent question. It's cool to actually have the question what's coming in the next two months because it means we're doing the right thing to some extent. We're making progress every couple of months. Yeah. Um, so in the next two months, um, the, uh, we're uh, completely re-architecting the Intel driver uh, so that uh, video mode setting and uh, moves into the kernel so that we can do pretty boot stuff. We can do um, fast user switching without flashing the screen, um, and we can have reliable uh, blue screen of death. You know, people complain about the Microsoft blue screen of death because it means the operating system is crashed. Well, in the Linux world, you can tell your operating system is crashed because your mouse stops moving on the screen. <laughs> I would, most users, most developers would far rather actually have information about the crash. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to provide that. Yeah. So, and uh, the other thing we're doing is uh, uh, MPX will get integrated, so we have multiple pointer support. Um, 
And we're also switching the 2D rendering architecture from user space down into the kernel so that you, would, um, so that you have 2D and 3D integrated in the same pipeline, you have objects sharing. So yeah, that's happening in the next couple of months. <laughs> yeah. I, we, we do need to go though, it's 10 after. Thank you much for your time today. Yes.